Thank you. you. May be seated, please. Once again, let me say welcome. Glad that you're here today. Uh, doing double duty today, Chris. Uh, play for Chris. He uh, had to go to Pittsburgh today for a family member. His aunt uh, passed away and said, you know, with a five-hour drive, he can't have worship here and then make it to Pittsburgh by 2 o'clock. So, uh, so, okay, we'll just pray for your journey. Always thankful for him and the great job that he does, but always appreciate the opportunity to sing and praise as well. So thank you for being here. If this is your first time, glad you're here. And as Karen said, if this is your however many time, glad you're here as well. It's always good to worship together. Uh, yesterday, you know, and this is, I, I, I bring this up just because God, you know, we built our building. I just love that song, um, Look What God Has Done. Just to praise Him for what He's uh, building physically and what He's building in us spiritually. That's, that's why we're here, to honor Him in all we do. And, and as we talk about our purposes, as we talk about even using our building, multi-purpose, sports, ministries, the one thing that's come up so often now is that we're allowed to do Celebration of Life services. And so yesterday, we uh, had Celebration of Life for Paul Treadway, who passed away recently. Paul was, I think they were here since the very first day of Crossroads, and when he retired, moved away, lived in South Carolina for the last several years. And I just want to thank everybody that pitched in, that helped, that we were able to, this uh, had a pretty good crowd yesterday. Um, you know, Paul was a um, cowboy at Frontier Town for years, and if you knew, he had that big handlebar mustache and with a black hat and, and a long coat, boy. So I, I can honestly say, not only from as a praise team, but at a funeral, we ended the service with singing Happy Trails. <laughs> and it was kind of fitting right after uh, It Is Well, which is what I like to do and sing. So uh, praise God for his life. Um, and again, thank all the folks that helped. We had uh, Mission Barbecue uh, brought in the food. And, and I just thank you all for doing that. And I thank God for giving us the opportunity to minister to families, just through using our building in this way and having the technology to stream. That's really become very important for people that are out of town or who can't make it. So, so thank you all. Well, we're continuing our study of Christian parenting. We're here between Mother and Father's Day. Next week, Father's Day. Dads, don't forget to make it here. We have your payday for you, as we've done the last several years. And uh, so as we've been looking at the foundations of parenting and looking at... Uh, what it takes to parent with faith. Today we're looking at part three, the fundamentals of parenting. And we're basically dealing with uh, correction uh, in terms of what we're to do and communication, how we speak to our children. I'm dealing mostly with younger children. Hopefully next week we can get a little further up the line in terms of age, but I, I just feel burdened by how important it is in this day and age that um, what's taught in the Bible is considered passe. And I want to make sure we read the word together, and so we can obey what it says. Parenting, and I'm speaking to you parents, is your primary calling. Parenting will mean you can't do all the things that you could otherwise do. It will affect your golf handicap. It may mean your home does not look like picture from Better Homes and Gardens. It will impact your career and ascent on the corporate ladder. It will alter the kind of friendships you will be available to pursue. It will mean that you can't develop every interest that comes along. The costs are high, and that's from the book Shepherding a Child's Heart by Ted Tripp. I'm going to quote him a lot today. I appreciate his insights. So what are the basic fundamentals of being a parent that cost so much? I'm showing you these two titles of books that I've been reading and uh, Shepherding a Child's Heart, What the Bible Says About Child, Child Training, Parenting with Confidence, just goes scripture by scripture in terms of how we're to treat our children. Last week, we talked about from Deuteronomy 6 that we're the teaching part, teaching our children. Let me read a quote from the preacher's sermon, a commentary. Teaching is experiencing the truth personally, living out the truth before our children. It is applying the truth of the commandments to one's heart and experiencing the truths within one's own life. Folks, this is so important when we're applying truth that it's not just saying, kids, you need to live this way. It is ourselves modeling what we're teaching. The children then see the truth of the commandments, live before their very eyes, and they absorb the truth, pick it up automatically, which is what Moses was saying when he said, teach it, and you're going in and you're going out, you're rising up, you're sitting down. And I'm going to put the chart up again that I showed last week, just as a reminder that the teaching or influence and the authority or control, the younger a child is, the more they have to be controlled. 
the more that they don't have their own control, and we have to provide that for them. We are God's representatives for, and I'm going to say this, His children. They're our children, but we only have them for a short time before then they go out on their own. And so we're to provide that control to help them develop their own control. And that's the descending line that a child will learn self-control. As they're learning self-control, our teaching capacity becomes greater. And so that when they're controlling themselves, by the time, and he shows here, 0 to 18, then we have the most to teach. Now, right in the center there is probably, I'll call it the tween years, 12 years old, 11, 12 years old. And often, I said this last week, that's a time when, when anybody comes to me for counseling, it'll be like, oh, my kid turned a teenager. I can't teach them anything. I know none of you have ever said that, but that's been said to me at one time. And the question comes in, well, have they learned to control themselves? Have they learned what it means to live under the influence of God and, and responding to Him? Because ultimately, that's really the issue. And that's one thing that Shepherding a Child's Heart have, has been teaching me, because I, I've just always wanted to control and then teach my children so that they behave well, so that they would honor God. But ultimately, it's about their relationship with Him. Not how well they behave, although that's secondary, that we then provide the control and provide the teaching so that they might live full and faithful lives. You know, I read this article, it just came up as often, you know, I go through all my headlines. Look at this headline, if you will, before I read the scripture. Atheist parents are better at raising their children. And this is out of Los Angeles, no surprise, but um, <laughs> the author writes, whether it's to instill traditional values or simply to get them into a good school, many parents raise their children, and hear this, to be religious and the belief that it's best for them. And I'm just going to pause right there. You'll notice I'm calling this Christian parenting, not godly parenting, not religious parenting, not church parenting, because it's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we're going to get that clear. So when they're looking at being religious, I look at this as, again, just the behavior model, not the relationship model. But it turns out there's just no need to be religious with studies showing that children raised without religion do just fine and in some areas outperform their religious counterparts. In a recent co-op-ed co -ed in the um, Los Angeles Times, sociologist Phil Zuckerman explains that far from bringing children up in a moral vacuum, atheism can give them better clarity about right and wrong because beliefs are more likely to be rooted in empathy rather than fear of punishment in the hereafter. i got to read that again. That their teaching, their values are more rooted in empathy, meaning trying to understand others, than fear of punishment in the fear after. Non-religious families, life is replete with its own sustaining moral values and enriching ethical precepts. Chief among those is rational problem solving, personal autonomy, independence of thought, avoidance of corporate punishment, a spirit of questioning everything, and far above all, empathy. I'm going to pause right there because I was reading that. They're focusing on the things of the flesh, the things of how we would say, here are the decisions you need to make. Particularly interesting is that we want to have no fear of punishment in the hereafter. How many as a young person, how many people here, fear of punishment in the hereafter kind of entered your life at a young age? Has that ever happened to you? It did to me. My dad, oh gosh, scared me to death. We would build a fire. Fires of hell, a lot hotter than this. Oh my gosh, I better get away. But from that, it's like, well, what in the world is he talking about? And, of course, gave me a Bible, began to read the Bible, and that there, hear this, there is a hereafter. And so much of the world is now saying, well, it doesn't really matter as long as you treat people well. And, again, to say, well, we have moral values. Where are those, how can you call them moral if you don't take the standard of what morality is? So it's basically saying, well, we can do these things without the word or the power of God. Live a good life. Do the best we can. It'll be okay. We don't need religion. Now, I would agree with that in terms of, no, we don't need religion. We need faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need the mind of Christ as he changes us so that we understand exactly what is in the human heart and why children behave the way they do and what we need to do about it. Because religion won't explain why a child, without being taught, does the wrong thing. Because we know that happens. We don't have to teach them to do that. So I'm going to read one verse to begin, and I believe this is really uh, Proverbs 29, 15, I think gives us the fundamentals of the things that I'm talking about and we'll be talking about today. Proverbs, we read, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, 
But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. The rod and rebuke give wisdom. Child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Well, the rod, it's a word that literally means to branch off. And so when you get to what the rod is, it's a switch. It's a little branch. It's something to inflict some pain. Not in anger, not in trying to destroy the child, but in a way that says, this is punishment for doing something wrong. That's the rod. I have people say to me, well, pastor, the rod is the Holy Spirit. He guides us. It's like, no, the rod is a physical piece of stick that you use. Rebuke, rebuke means, it, 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 the word literally means to be among in the midst of. And so it's basically saying a, a disagreement with the works that are done. In other words, you rebuke somebody, you're saying this is wrong, condemning that. Interestingly, but a child left to himself, the word here in the Hebrew, it means to send. You know, there's really no neutrality. So if we just say, well, we're going to let a child decide for themselves, you might as well be saying, I'm just going to send them and not pay attention to them, and they're on their own. And how does the result come about? They will bring shame to his mother. Well, let's dig deeper into what we're talking about here. And the first is I'm calling foundational communication. That child left to himself. If not left to himself, what is the opposite of that? That's bringing them to us. That's developing this relationship. And Ted Tripp writes this, these words, Full, rich, multifaceted communication is the cement that holds a parent and child together. Communication will provide the context for a growing unity with your children. They know when they have a relationship with people who are wise and discerning, who know and understand them, who love and are committed to them. They will know if you know the ways of God, understand life and people in the world, and are prepared to carry out a relationship of integrity and security. This comes up over and over again. Children will know. They'll know if you know. Because they're constantly questioning, they're constantly examining and watching, and therefore this left to themselves sending away has to be reversed by saying, what does our relationship look like with our children? Hopefully, first point, it will be a genuine relationship. And I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians 5.14. You know, often when Paul talks about the church, and I'll, I'll use this even in marriages, that the relationship of the people in the church apply to the relationships of people in the home which makes sense. Jesus said, we're two or more gathered. I'm in the midst of them. So I believe a marriage relationship is the microcosm of the church. Add children to that, and therefore, as a family grows, the church is grown and is added to. So when you look at Paul's commands to the church, I believe they apply to the family as well. Look what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. We exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient, with all. This word warn, it's two Greek words. It means to place in the mind. In other words, part of instructions to understand that those who are unruly, and that word means out of place, are not arranged, disruptive. So our job in communication is to place in the mind a behavior that's not correct. Secondly, he says to comfort the fainthearted. Comfort means soothing speech, easy to understand. And then um, the faint-hearted, those that have basically not understood what strength can be in the Lord. Then finally, uphold the weak. And this word weak, I just like this, it means lacking, um, lacking a personal, lacking personhood. In other words, not completely there and an undeveloped soul. Well, I read that and I think, well, that's not just for adults in the church. I think he's describing children. People that aren't quite developed yet, they are weak, so we need to strengthen them. And this last part of it all, patient with all. Parents, how many times have you prayed for patience? And then the kids get more unruly. Well, that's sometimes the answer to prayer, because God makes you want, you have to dig deeper to understand. Now, I didn't read the scripture under genuine relationship, Proverbs 20, verse 5. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Are we intentional enough to say what's going on with our children at any age to initiate that foundational communication? 
That's so vital. How else are they going to know? How else are they going to appreciate control according to the word of God if, number one, we're not living controlled lives, and number two, then we're not digging deep to draw out what's going on with our children? It comes from asking good questions. Secondly, and, and I just saw this clip yesterday, someone put on Facebook, that one of the best gifts we can give our children are rules. John 14, 21, Jesus said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and manifest myself to him. As God gave us commandments, and we don't now obey the commandments so that we might earn eternal life, we obey the commandments because now the greatest commandment is that we love God, all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We do what he says because we love him. And how do we love him? He sent his son that we might have a relationship, which then we're representing God, and we have a relationship with our children and have that same relationship, and they listen and follow what we do. Does that make sense? We talked about this two weeks ago, that the calling on our lives is that this is what God has called us to do. That's why this other article about, oh, atheist parents are so much better. Their calling is just probably to just survive and get through and put their kids out in the world and hope they survive. Our calling is that we're looking at eternal issues, the heart that's far from God, and understanding what God has done in our lives to see our children be part of the kingdom of God. And so we give them rules. And as we get into the rod part, as we get into the chastisement part, it's because of a broken rule. Children will be children. There'll be spilled things. There'll be accidents because they're just rambunctious and things will happen. But discipline comes when rules are disobeyed. So giving them rules is very important. Third part of communication is growing in responsibility. And what's the ultimate responsibility? Understanding that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Paul says, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. In other words, given the rules, here's the instruction. The rules are disobeyed. Oops, sorry. No, 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 no. More than sorry, but that attitude of repentance, which means to change. You were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us and nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Or I might just paraphrase that, the sorrow of getting caught (laughs) with no change. Again, you see the progression. Without this genuine understanding and connection with our children, without guiding them and saying, here are the rules that we follow, that we grow in responsibility, because when you don't follow the rules, there is discipline, and ultimately there is change, that we give them resources. In other words, this goes back into that sending away, child left to his own. Okay, Dad, how do I do this? Well, here's what God provides through his word and through our love and support for you to help you. Isaiah 41, 9 and 10. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and have not cast you away. In other words, not left you to yourself. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You know, even very young children can know that God loves them. They can know that God's there for them. They can know that God has commandments to follow, but they can know that God's forgiving. They can know that God sent his only son that they might have eternal life. So when we see these resources, are we giving of ourselves of what God has given us to plan, just to develop our children in a way that's foundational? Ted Tripp writes again, communication is not all, it doesn't just discipline, it also disciples, it shepherds, hence the, that title, the shepherding a child's heart, just, just so impactful. This is the point, your communication with your children will take many forms, and that's, I just wrote the different forms that they brought out, I was just bringing out here in 1 Thessalonians 5. How do we communicate? We encourage, we correct, we rebuke, we'll talk about that in just a moment, entreat, which means we plead, we instruct, we warn, and we pray. Prayer is a way of communication. Praying with your children and even before your children to ask God's forgiveness for things that you might have made a mistake with. I'm not the perfect parent. Do they understand that? Do they realize how authentic you are and wanting the best for them and giving them resources, including how to pray and what to pray for? Giving warnings, giving instructions. All part of, again, bringing children to us and not just saying, well, you're on your own. 
That's why it's so important, if we back up a step, that we have to understand, is our relationship in Christ a secure one? Or are we just trying our best? No, we've got to We've got to understand that we go to the Word, we understand how He's leading and guiding us, then we can pass that on to our children in a way that helps them see their lives change in Jesus Christ. This verse just, just comes over and over in my head. The child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Uh, again, in the same clip, it just, just came up yesterday, somebody posted, just one, of the, one of the best things you can say to a child is, no, no, you don't do this. Foundational communication. Uh, you know, I love vocabulary, so this uh, is caught my attention, study of words, and it's entitled, this headline, Richer Vocabulary. If you get a richer vocabulary, you have a richer life. And they actually bring out three Greek words that can help you be happier and more successful today. And one of the words is actually based on the word happiness in Greek. Uh, another one is uh, eidos, which means reverence, and that's a good one as well. Arete, which is the basic sense of excellence of any kind. And I, I appreciated an article that just says that, you know, as you learn, as you understand in different languages, that it can help you build on the things that you know. Now, obviously, to me, great to read this in the newspaper, but how much better to read in the Word of God and dig a little deeper and say, you know, this word really means this in the Greek? Now, seminary education, still required. You have to take a few years of Greek, which I did. But folks, you can get online, you can Google a word, you can go into a commentary, you can go into an interlinear your Bible, you can click on the word and go into the concordance and you can see all that it means. You can do this. You mean I'm a Greek scholar? Yes. Don't sell yourself short with the tools that God has given us to study his word. I got to tell you a funny story. My mom's here. My mom, my mom used to work at Hershey's Men's Store. And uh, it was in Bel Air, right downtown Bel Air. The store had been there, oh gosh, 30s, mom, early 30s, long time. Anyway, well, mom, mom had a seamstress that was from Greece that worked in the office, in the, in the shop. Well, she knew I was in seminary and I was studying Greek. So I come home for Christmas, first year, and uh, she can't wait to introduce me. What was her name, mom? I forget. You remember? She didn't remember. Anyway, this woman comes out speaking fluent Greek. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, Koine Greek in the New Testament, it's different than conversational Greek. I just said, agape. I, I, just, just, <laughs> I love, love God. And uh, I think my mom was so disappointed. I was just like, mom, it's a, it's a different form of Greek, how it was written. And yet, and, and let me just say this, again, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed. English sometimes can't even give the most accurate description of what the word defines. Even as I just said that, agape, love. There's like at least four words for love. Philos, brotherly love. Agape, which is the infinite, giving only love, not expecting anything in return. Eros, erotic love. And so when you hear someone say, I love you, well, boy, in breaking it down the Greek, when you see agape love, that's God's love because he gives and gives and gives. So don't hesitate when you might be confused or you're reading a verse to do a quick search, look it up, and say, well, what does this word mean? And for yourself, just get a deeper understanding and have that richer, richer life because you understand the word of God more. That's, that's my challenge for you. Secondly now, bigger challenge, is not just faithful communication because we talked about the rules, we talked about this relationship, is faithful Correction. I almost put forceful correction, but it sounds too negative. Faithful correction. And I'm just going to give some quick adjectives. That means it's consistent, it's compassionate, and it's corporate, meaning as parents, you agree on what you're doing. Proverbs 29, 15, the first part, we just talked about the sending away and the relationship, says the rod and the rebuke give Wisdom. I just mentioned the rod. It means to branch off. It means a switch. It means a physical element of discipline. Ted Tripp defines it this way. I really like it. The rod is a parent in faith toward God and faithfulness toward his or her children, undertaking the responsibility of careful, timely, measured, and controlled use of physical punishment to underscore the importance of obeying God. Thus, rescuing the child from continuing in his foolishness until death. What a great definition. The controlled use of physical punishment to underscore the importance of obeying God, not just obeying the parent, obeying God. 
Thus, hear this, rescuing the child from continuing in his foolishness until death. You know, when the Bible talks about wisdom, you know the beginning of wisdom? Tell me. The fear of God. And so, as he's saying here, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, there's an element of fear here. Why? Because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And unlike this article in the Los Angeles paper that's not anywhere concerned about any kind of eternal punishment, the Bible's very clear that the wages of sin is death. And obviously, the sin they're referring to is disobeying and dishonoring and never accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about discipline in terms of spanking somebody. That's not your goal, not death. But the, the, the heart, the sin of the heart is death. The wage of sin is death. That's why Jesus came. So that's why in the control section of that little graph that we're to use the rod and use rebuke to give this wisdom. You've read this verse before, Proverbs 13, 24, and I'm just calling this the determined heart. The determined heart on your part, because it's necessary, because your child has a de determined heart not to do what you say. Here we go. Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son. You hear this often. Spare the rod, spoil the child. You probably said that, probably heard it, but look at what the Bible says. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. In other words, Something happens, a rule is broken, punishment is given. That's the discipline heart. I've shared this story a million times, and I won't tell you which child it was, but I happened to be sitting in the living room, and my two, two of my children were fighting, and they come running to the living room not knowing that I was sitting there. And so they're running through, fighting, 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 and freeze right in front of me because I'm just sitting there on the couch. And my one child had his hand just like this. And I said, if you touch them, and you know what they did? Boop. <laughs> Look at me right in the eye. Bing. Didn't hurt them. He was rebellious in that moment against me. And quickly was disciplined by my determined heart because he was testing me. I heard, a, I heard a family say this once. They said, you know, you draw this line. That's what a rule is. And when the person steps over the line... This is the result of that behavior. Folks, it seems so simple, and I see over and over again, well, don't you do that. No, no, don't you do that. And the line just keeps moving. And what's a child then to think? Oh, I can bargain here. Oh, maybe I can get away with a little explanation or something that's not as bad as they think it is. No, he who spares, now hear this, he, he who spares his rod hates his son. We're going to talk about it in just a moment. Well, oh, that's in Hebrews. We'll, we'll get there in just a moment. Because our loving God disciplines us. Our loving God disciplines us because he's our heavenly father. And we don't want to hear those words because God's all loving. This is what's happening now with all that's going on in our society. God's merciful. He's gracious. He's loving. And just like this article, there's no payment for sin and judgment in the afterlife. And just kind of shooing that away because no one was ever taught, here is the response to a behavior that's not right. That comes from a determined heart. 22.15 says this, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of a correction will drive it far from him. Now, I'm going to just do a quick tangent here. People say, well, if I hit my child, they're going to learn to hit, and they're going to do that. That's not what the Bible teaches, folks. The Bible, we're talking about a switch. I'm not talking about a belt. I'm not talking about anything harder. I'm, and I'm talking about hitting on the bottom. Don't hit on the face. Don't use your hand. Your hand is a symbol of your giving and caring for a child. Use a symbol. In fact, as my kids got a little older, I would tell them to go get their own switch. And then we'd talk about how many licks do you think you need? To understand, and I did it very calmly, it's not in anger. It's according to, this is, this is what I do because I love you, and this is a result of behavior that doesn't honor God. Does that make sense? Because this is not being taught. Now it's all, we can't do this and legally, and I would just say do it in private because now somebody says it's corporate punishment and you're, dis, you're, you're in child abuse. Folks, hear this very clearly. Done with compassion, done, done in a way that's consistent. It is not child abuse. Can you hear that? It's not. In fact, let's just go on. Deliverance from hell, Proverbs 23. 
and this is still in 23, 13 and 14. Do not withhold correction from a child. If you beat him with a rod, he shall not die. And I don't really like the word beat there. I would just say if you switch him with a rod, he will not die. You shall switch him with a rod. Okay, beat him with a rod. And deliver his soul from hell. Right out of the scripture, when someone says, well, I just can't do this because the Bible's very clear. Do not withhold correction from a child. And if you disagree with me and you say, well, I can't use a rod. I want to use a timeout. I want to use this or that. Even if you do that, I think that's secondary to this, then do it consistently. Do it compassionately. Do it in a way that you agree so that a child knows they're being punished for their behavior. But I believe the Bible's very clear in this. And we, we take this not for granted, but I think we just forget about it, that you shall deliver his soul from hell. Because ultimately, if that line of control never drops, and they never learn to control themselves, and never learn to d obey authority, they'll eventually grow into an adult that just doesn't obey authority at another level, not your level, government level, and who knows what will happen there. And then ultimately, not obeying the authority of God will stand before him and be punished forever for not coming to him. That's what we do when we faithfully correct our children with the rod. Now, now I'm going to go to Hebrews 12 because this then refers to God's chastening and he's comparing it to what God does. Hebrews 12, 11, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Boy, I just love when someone says, I can't understand the scripture. Yes, you do. Chastening isn't joyful. Although we're considered all joy when we go through various trials, James tells us. But listen, painful, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You see that? That's the promise of God there. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We can trust God at his word to say, this is how it's done. Here's what we do to control. Here's what we do with our relationship and, and, and then to teach our children. Not many amens today. Is, is this coming through? I, I'm really just trying to give you, it's like that other book, what the Bible says about child training. Here are the verses. Yes, there's God, there are verses about God's mercy. Yes, there's verses about his grace, his unmerited favor. But for the parent and, boy, just... If you spend time in Proverbs, so much wisdom and understanding. God knows what's best for us. Do we understand that the discipline brings the harvest? And for ourselves, in terms of Hebrews 11. I don't know if I read it later on. I'm going to just go turn to it now because I know you guys know it. Of what he promises us. He says, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as son. This is verse 5 of 11. My son, do not despise the chasing of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. You know, I think I'm going to read that a little later. I'm going to read it now. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? That's what we said earlier, that brings them to himself, that doesn't let him go on his own, that doesn't send him away, that says, here's what I want to do for you so that you might be and have this relationship with God. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not really much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? That's the ultimate goal. That's why it gets back to the very beginning, parent now, for all of you who aren't parents, that we're ultimately sons and daughters of Almighty God and have to honor his authority. That's where we come to. It's all about God. It's all about his relationship with us through Jesus. As we obey his commandments, we show his love for him. That's what it comes down to. And he gives the harvest a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Speaking of parents, again, you can get these headlines that you just can't ignore. This is about parents at Little League baseball games. And look at the headline, liquored up, entitled, and unhinged. Wow. And it's an article about the coaches that have just had enough with parents, fed up with parents, cursing umpires, acting in ways, getting in fights. And so this is out of the Philadelphia Inquirer. So this Little League president, Don Batsufi, this is out of... Um, where is it? Uh, Deptford League, Little League, somewhere outside of Philadelphia, recently made international news by instituting this punishment for parents. Unruly parents will be banned from attending games, listen, until they umpire three games themselves. I love it. Wait a minute. You're going to do all this again? Okay, you're going to be back in the game? You've got to umpire. Woo! 
Oh, but I'm, I'm already having arguments with these parents. You mean I got to put them in that? Exactly. And that's exactly what I'm talking about because you see, the discipline, the training, the relationship that we're giving our children is reflective of what God is doing with us. Put that together. It's not just, okay, follow this list, do this. No, it's incorporated in what would God have us to have abundant life in Jesus Christ. That's why he sent his only son. And now, now just our brains can't even capture this, that God, through his son, paid the wrath for our sins onto Jesus Christ, that we wouldn't have to, have to bear it. And years ago, I, I heard an evangelist tell a story that his kids were at that cross point on that graph and would not get under his control. This is honest truth. His name was Bill Long. So he said when he was around that age, he and his brothers, they were just raising Cain all the time. And so his father came into them one night, both of he and his brother, and said, okay. He said, I don't know what else to do for you kids except for you to really understand my heart about what it means to discipline you. So I want you to go get a switch, kind of where I got the idea of your punishment. And then this is what he did. When they came back with their switches, he said, now I want you to switch me because I'm going to take your punishment for you. And so he laid down on the bed and exposed his back. And they were like, Dad, no, no, no. And he forced them to switch him. And he said that night as they were going to bed, they saw his mother in the bedroom. And she was just kind of putting some gauze on his father's back. And he said, it changed my life that my father would love me enough to show me what God's love is for me, that he would take my punishment. Never forgotten that story. I've also never done it either to follow that up with my own children. But it meant a lot to me. I did have them choose their own switch. That's how connected all this is. It isn't just, oh, do you spank your children or not? No, it's, it's, it's all in the, it, encompassed by this relationship with Almighty God who wants us to know him and, and wants us to know that he loves us when we go through difficult times. Uh, that's his discipline. And then we see things that we never saw before in the same way for our children. That's why I call it this faithful correction. And the second part of that is the rod and the rebuke. The faithful correction of the rod, now the faithful correction of the rebuke. Which I said earlier, it means to censor, it means to disapprove behavior. How do we do that? Well, that's why it goes in order here about the communication. We, that, we have that relationship. It is the action of Christ. I, I read it earlier, but I'm going to read it again. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. In other words, in prayer, through the word of God, maybe through a, a loving brother or sister who confronts you to say, you have disobeyed God. Here is your rebuke. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. It's going to happen. So when we say, oh, no, I, I just can't do that to my children. Well, God does it and he loves us. Are, are you better than God? Of course not. Well, we don't want to reflect God in that way because we want to be merciful and gracious. Of course we're merciful and gracious, but we're also obedient to what the Bible tells us. And folks, I'm, I'm saying it's not easy. And you've heard the adage, you know, well, this, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it hurts you. you. In fact, I just read that recently somewhere, and the little boy says, well, it's not going to hurt you in the same place it's going to hurt me, that's for sure. It's difficult. But, but isn't obedience difficult? Because we sin and fall short of the glory of God. Even those who have been born again and we have the Holy Spirit in us, he convicts us. He provides a way of temptation. We can escape it. That we can live a Christ-like life according to who God is. Our children can live a Christ-like life according to who God is through us that we teach them and, and commit our lives to them that they might know him. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. That's it. That's it. And so here's the rebuke. This is disapproved behavior. And Ted Tripp, back in his book, he calls it an appeal to the conscience. Also in Proverbs 23, boy, we could just read that, you know, Psalm 23, everybody knows that one. Proverbs 23, apply your heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge. And then verse 19, hear my son and be wise, guide your heart in the way. And what is the way? It's what we've been talking about. We're not here to teach our opinions to our children. We're here to teach them what God wants them to know about him. And how are they going to know it unless we're like him? 
told you this before, the best compliment I think I've ever received when someone said to me, you know, I ask all these questions and all you do is tell me what the Bible says. I'm like, great, (laughs) great, because that's what you need to know. This is our authority. This is how we raise children. This is what we do with our marriages. This is how we grow as a church. It's about him and what God commands us to do. So this faithful correction is also rebuke. It's It's not just spanking. It's in the relationship. It's calling behavior that you disapprove, that God disapproves. Hear, my son, and be wise. Guide your heart in the way. Anyhow, I've been speaking all this about the Bible. Oh, I I thought it was my microphone. Okay. I, I need to go back a couple verses, don't I? It did, it did happen once in church that my son, Kirk, uh, I will say it was him. He was like three, and he was, he was, the teacher called me in. And it's like, okay, and I came, I even forget where I was, came down to the building. I pulled him out of class, and I disciplined him. I spanked him in private. But when I got back to class, everybody knew what had happened. And every single child at that table was sitting like this. And all I said was, anybody else? No, Pastor Bob, no. I love you all. God bless you. See you later. I do try to practice what I preach. I do. But look at this. Look at this out of Utah. Utah School District bans the Bible from schools after citing vulgarity and violence. You don't think there's a spiritual battle in this country? And now somebody could take a headline. Hey, Pastor, you like headlines. What do you quote me from the Bible for? You know it's vulgar and violent, that Bible? Salt Lake City, the good book is being treated like a bad book in Utah after a parent, frustrated by efforts to ban materials from schools, convinced a suburban district that some Bible verses were too vulgar or violent for children. Now, there's some violent things in the Bible. And it talks about perversity. It it, it does. The 72,000 student Davis School District north of Salt Lake City removed the Bible from its elementary and middle schools while keeping it in its high schools. After a committee reviewed their scripture in response to a parental complaint, the district has removed other titles. It goes through here. A district spokesperson, Chris Williams, said it doesn't differentiate between requests to review books. In other words, it doesn't really matter what the book. But it came down to, it's unknown who made the request for the Bible to be banned, but the copy of the complaint... All the requests go through the, the, um, the committee, and it noted the Bible contains instances of incest, prostitution, and rape. The complaint derided a bad faith process and said the district was ceding our children's education, First Amendment rights, and library access to Parents United. So they left off one of the most... Yeah, Utah Parents United left off one of the most sex-ridden books around the Bible, the parents' complaint said. Wow, I'm just going to stop there. This is unbelievable to me. And yet, all that's going on, what did I just say? Here is our authority. This is how we raise our children. This is how God shows that he loves us. Is, it, is there, are all there violent scenes? Sure they are. Are there R-rated? Well, uh, you can get to some points where it's like it could be a little bit, uh, you know, again, as parents, how you teach your children, what you say to them, we know that God gives us his truth. But to then say, okay, we're just going to ban it. Okay, there goes your authority. Folks, that's the battle that we're facing. How dare you discipline your children in this way. How dare you give a rebuke and say, this is right and wrong. They've got to figure this out for themselves. I'm hearing it every day. And you hear this, that that word in the Hebrew means literally to send them away. By your not dealing with it, you're sending them away. And back to the earlier scripture, to hell itself. Our church in Georgia we had a deaf ministry, and um, I remember talking to one of the parents who had a deaf child, and she said it was really difficult when I went to correct my child. He's running toward the street, and i got to tell him to get back here, but he can't hear me. So she said I had to learn to pick up whatever I could to throw at him so he wouldn't run into the street. You're laughing because you think, oh, my gosh. But if she didn't, he could have been killed in the street. Now, hopefully they weren't on a rocky beach or something. There was a tennis ball or something nearby. But I've never forgotten that story because she said, I love him enough that I don't, that's, I don't want him to go there. And here we are in the same way. The rod of correction, the rebuke of correction in the context of a relationship. And I'm sure that little boy, oh, there's mom throwing stuff at me again. 
because she loves me. She desires the best for me. And here's my parent with the rod because he loves me. I'm looking to see if my son Jordan's here. Jordan, are you here? Is he in the nursery? Well, I've told this story a million times. I'm going to tell you one more time. Jordan, he went through a real rough time. He wouldn't go to bed, and so here I am, bad with the switch again. So I just decided that when he put in bed and he's going to give pitch a fit, I'm going to stand in the hallway at his doorway, the light from the hallway, and I was going to stand there with my switch so he could set my silhouette on the wall. <laughs> and every time he made a fuss, shoot, I disciplined him. And it was a lot of times. It took a week. The final night, I stood there and he didn't get out of bed. So, hey, I could go to bed. So I started going to bed. Dad, where are you going? (laughs) So I'm going to bed. (laughs) Think I'm doing this for my health? I like you standing there. I like you standing there. Because he knew I had his best interest at heart. He's a lot better sleeper than I am now, let me tell you. <laughs> but he was being rebellious. And that sounds something simple to you. And are you consistent? Are you compassionate? And back to the switch thing, I would literally hit myself in the leg so I knew how hard I was hitting. So I, I wouldn't be an abusive. And then afterwards, I would always hug them and pray with them. God created the family, and his plan is for a man and a woman to marry for life to raise children to know and honor him. Boy, and I know that statement is passe, but folks, it's the truth. Children are gifts from God. He cares about and gives instructions on how they are to be trained. This is especially important. I've, I've, used, this, I've used this all three weeks because it's so important. In today's world where biblical roles and responsibilities are being challenged and ignored or thrown away, Training involves discipline, which includes developing a good relationship with our children, using the rod decisively, and rebuking them to appeal to their consciences and be encouraged to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you how much you love us. Even when you discipline us, even, and I believe with all my heart, as the Holy Spirit dwells within your followers that we know We know when we've crossed that line. And for many of us, it doesn't take long because we know when you're disciplining us. God, help us to share that others would know that. Not that you're a disciplining God, but that you're a loving God. And you desire the best for us. And what's the best? You're preparing a place for us in heaven. And God, I pray for every parent here who I know in their heart would say, and I want my children to be there with me. So help us, God, to be obedient to your word, not the world to your word. Understand how your love is communicated and how our children are to grow in you. God, we commit ourselves to that this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn of response um, because I, I believe the Bible says that his word does not return void. And God may be stirring in your heart. And I'll just say to you, I'll, I'll be willing to talk to you. We're, I, I can't do it, be in the sermon series forever. We're going to have at least one more week if you're struggling in this area. And, uh, but more importantly, the most important thing is, are you struggling in the area of faith? Do you know that Jesus died for your sins? Do you know that God desires the best for you and that his word is true? Maybe you've never made that kind of profession. You've never made a commitment to God. Today can be that day. That we have the little tear-off sheets. I know you've already written your prayer request, and maybe you just need prayer for your family. Man, we do that. But the most important box on here is I want to commit or recommit my life to Jesus. And it might be as a parent, as an aunt or an uncle, even without children, as just one helping with children. You know, we're always open to people working in our nursery just to be able to help our children. So that's why we're going to sing. And uh, as we do, the usher is going to collect these. We're going to collect our offering, and it just... I would just ask you to examine your hearts. Just do business with God as the praise team sings.